Hello, consensus. Woo! My, my guests today literally need no introduction, but nonetheless, we are going to go through that. I'm here to talk about AI and its implications for data privacy with Ben Gertzel, CEO of SingularityNet, uh, a distributed AI project that uh, promises to perhaps address some of the problems we want to talk about today. And of course, Edward Snowden, president of the Freedom of the Press Foundation, who is in remotely for us. Edward, hello. You got us? Yeah, I got you. Can you hear me? Awesome. Great. Thanks for being here today, Edward and Ben. Um, to just set the stage very quickly, uh, we have seen, obviously, an explosion in interest over the last six to nine months in uh, generative AI in particular, but we are going to see a lot of uh, different aspects of that continuing to grow. Um, and obviously, AI is both very dependent on data um, and has really spectacular capacities to handle data, and it changes uh, the stakes for some of the issues that really lie at the core of what crypto is about and why people care about it, um, or at least you know some ideas that everybody in crypto uh, is is very concerned with. Um, my first question is, you know, we're going to try and keep things a bit open, but uh, this one is is primarily for for Edward. Um, you know, we do and we have now for years, unfortunately, lived in a reality where mass surveillance and data gathering are omnipresent practically, whether it's government or private. Um, and I would like to hear uh, your, I think, frankly ominous take on what the increasing capacity of artificial intelligence means for those huge data troves that already exist and are constantly growing data about what all of us do on a day-to-day -day basis in our private lives that are in the hands of corporations and governments. What does AI mean for, for all of that surveillance? Yeah, I, I think in order to understand where we are, where we're headed, we have to understand what we've been. Uh, so, you know, as it was mentioned, it's about 10 years ago uh, that I wrote a little email that started like this. It said, uh, Every border you cross, every purchase you make, every call you dial, every cell phone tower you pass, friend you keep, article you write, site you visit, subject line you type, and packet that you route is in the hands of a system whose reach is unlimited and whose safeguards are not. Uh, the journalist that I wrote that to went on with a team of others, that was Laura Poitras, uh, to break headlines on front pages around the world uh, in basically every language. Uh, that revealed a criminal conspiracy uh, between major intelligence agencies, the Anglophone world, uh, to deliver upon us this new secret reality, which was uh, everything that they could reach uh, on everyone, everywhere, was being ingested uh, into systems without any regard to whether or not you were actually suspected of having done anything wrong. Uh, it was simply done as a matter of course, because it was possible, because it was cheap, because it was easy. And I want to underline the uh, criminal part of that conspiracy uh, because that's not just rhetoric. Courts in the United States, the United Kingdom, and elsewhere have all ruled that was a violation of the law, a uh, violation even of basic human rights, meaning specifically that even as to the most noble of intentions, uh, that practice was not something uh, that was within the legitimate authority of any state to do at all. But the important thing from that is that they didn't stop. And this brings us to today. They're doing it even more now. Uh, they changed their laws to try to shake themselves loose from having answer to the courts. Uh, and, and the question that we need to consider when looking to the future is if government is you know, the great teacher of the people, uh, as has been said, uh, what lesson did the rest of the world, uh, particularly corporations, draw from that, uh, that impunity uh, for the law breaking? Um, and the policy assumption that has been projected to everyone, that this is something that's necessary and legitimate to do. Not only are they going to do it regardless of what courts say, uh, they're going to do it even more. Um, well, 10 years is a long time in technology. If we were all being ingested into a system, and the reality back then was that it would end up on the desk of a person like me, who had a front 
called XKey score, that was the code name for it, uh, which was a kind of Google for size. I and many others had to manually go into this uh, distributed uh, federated query system, as it's called, because the data is so vast and it's in so many places, you can't move it from uh, this data center over there back to the NSA without everyone realizing what's happening. So what we do is we send what's small, the query, what you're picking for, to all the taps all around the world, basically. And then they process it for you against all of us, and then they send back just the results. Um, and this is where we see decentralization uh, being used for, for sort of evil rather than mm. good. It's a centralized system. Uh, it's a decentralized kind of query. Now, they were trying to automate this in the crudest of ways, just uh, uh, they had their own uh, sort of almost bash scripting type system uh, where they would go, all right, anything that matches this grep state, try to pull off the wire. Um, what if we didn't need to do queries? We didn't, we didn't have to move the shell game around. What if the data centers answered the questions for us? What if they took out the constraint, which was how many people like me could they find and clear uh, and get to keep the secret? Uh, it was done everyone uh, automatically, algorithmically, by machines that would never betray them, right? Uh, well, the secret would have been kept forever. And that's where we're headed. We're seeing more power concentrated into fewer hands. And we're seeing companies, corporations, and other states that didn't have this technology 10 years ago, but now they do, go, well, why don't we do this too? They can't complain too loudly if they're doing it more than anyone, right? Uh, and so now we see Amazon, Facebook, everybody, Microsoft, your insurance agency, the, you know, hospital, uh, all looking at trying to adopt these same capabilities. Uh, and I, I think the question is, you know, as it moves from ads onto other things, most people queue onto the things that are uh, photogenic that you can immediately sort of arrest and wrap and, and, and visualize, which are pictures, facial recognition, you think about security cameras, you think about license plate readers, and that's true, that's there. The driver's license databases, access to them is sold uh, by many states, whether it's to researchers and academics, uh, whether it's to private companies. Uh, your passport is this big shifted uh, through the wire, processed by these third-party companies to get a visa. Uh, all of those pictures on your social media. Uh, the idea here is that the face is presumed to be a universally unique identifier. And there is nothing more that computers love, programmers love, and people who run large databases and collect data sets love than being able to uniquely identify actors within a set. Uh, that's your phone number, right? That's your email address. No one else has these. They belong to you. Uh, usernames are not universally unique across the web, but they are on a service. They are on a platform. And I think the thing that you think about the implications uh, that we haven't hit but are, are about to hit hard is we need to move away from this. Uh, because when the machines start doing the thinking for the people, uh, and they're reasoning probabilistically the same way that I would reason probabilistically, right? Uh, but there is some kind of accountability, or at least we hope there's some kind of accountability. It's not true. Yeah. Uh, but the system depends on the idea that there's accountability. What happens when the machine starts making mistakes? And what happens when the machine starts making mistakes? The accountability question is key, particularly because of certain features of the nature of this technology, which is that when you rely on vast data centers and a ton of processing to create the models, that has economic sort of implications for centralization. Ben, can you talk us through, um, for people who might not be familiar with just how AI works, can you just talk us through why corporations, big corporations like Google, uh, like Meta now, and, and to a perhaps lesser extent, governments have an advantage in building AI models and then consequently are more likely to wind up in control of them long term. Yeah, so the AI field is actually a fairly big umbrella. I've been doing AI since 1980s. The field was named in the late 50s. It's really been around since 1940s perhaps when the first neural nets were created. And there's a lot of different approaches to AI out there. Certain approaches have been 
prioritized by, by big tech companies for a com combination of, of, of reasons, right? So what we're seeing now, we're seeing a flourishing of certain types of neural net architectures. I mean, ChatGPT has gotten all the press, but it's been, it's been going on for a, a number of years. We had face recognition starting out in 2014, 15 with AlexNet and the other software. This flourishing of neural net AI, you know, it's amazing. It's created a lot of, of highly valuable products. It's going to obsolete whole industries, create other industries. One aspect of this particular type of AI is it's very highly data intensive. And it's no coincidence that the AI field has been pushed in a direction of highly data intensive AI algorithms by companies that are sitting on incomparably large amounts, amounts of, of data, right? So there's other kinds of AI, such as logical reasoning systems or evolutionary learning, which also have a long history, also are interesting, also could be accelerated by modern compute hardware, but don't need that much data. These are getting quite short shrift in, in, in the corporate AI <laughs> R&D world by no great mystery because big companies don't have such an intrinsic advantage. There's still an advantage of needing more processing, but with, with current neural net models, big companies have two advantages. They've got loads of money for processing and they've got all, all, all this data. So they've, they've got a, a huge advantage over everybody else. Now, governments in theory have this advantage also, but due to being less agile and advanced technology, have not leveraged it as well as big, big tech companies, right? I mean, government agencies, yeah, they're accumulating all sorts of data. I mean, I, I actually, I lived in DC from 2001 to 2010 and did, among many other things, I did bits and pieces of AI consulting for various three-letter agencies in, in Washington. And it was, it was clear there was a lot of data there. It was, it was also clear they didn't have nearly as intelligent ways of mining all this data as, as, as I would have assumed, right? Like if, if they knew what they wanted to go after, they could query databases to find that thing. But they weren't doing like these broad-based queries, like, you know, find me all the people anywhere who might be involved in, in this sort of thing. They didn't have the sophistication to do these sorts of, of AI queries across all their knowledge, whereas the Googles and Facebooks of the world they are able to do analogous things, like find me all the people who may be involved in this kind of job who buy this sort of product. Government was not as sophisticated. They had the processing power and the data. They're not able in the US sort of to hire and build tech teams of the caliber of big tech companies. And China is a little different. I mean, Ch China has more sophisticated tech teams, has, has been my, my impression, w w working on these sorts of government, military, intelligence-oriented oriented AI projects because their systems organized, organized differently. Now, one point of interest is as AI just works better and better, you don't need to be that savvy anymore mm. to apply advanced AI to searching humongous tro troves of data. So, I mean, you could, you could put the pieces together and see, you know, various government agencies for good and or for ill, depending on your perspective, are gonna be able to perform open-ended searches against all the data that they're gathering with a lot more facility than was mm -hmm. possible in the past. We then come back to a point that David Brin, who a, is a science fiction writer, but he's also a political theorist, and he wrote a book in the mid 90s, I think it was, called The Transparent Society he said, we have two choices going forward, surveillance or surveillance, which is playing a bit with the French language. Like, I mean, surveillance meaning the powers that be are watching everyone. Surveillance meaning everyone is watching everyone. And he, he, he's a very smart guy. There, there was a certain point there. And his, his point was that if everyone's watching everyone, then you're also watching the powers that be watch you at least. But he didn't really foresee the modern crypto world and the technology we have now, which gives interesting additional possibilities, right? Which is that you can, you can put data out there encrypted with different combinations of keys associated with different, different people and, and different groups. And there, there are interesting possibilities where you have data that's out there being observed by different AIs that are 
controlled by different people, giving different people different level, levels of, of visibility. Yeah. So there, there's more subtlety than what he saw. But in the end, what he saw was broadly accurate. Like he, he <laughs> saw in the 90s then, like the technology yeah. to share all data is going to be there. The technology to look, at, look for whatever patterns you want, all data is going to be there. And the question is going to be, who is exercising that capability yeah. for what ends? And this, this question is going to really come to a fine point in, in the next few years. Now, technologies like chat, GPT, and such have relatively severe limitations now, but I can see how to overcome them, and probably others can also, right? So, I mean, they have issues with creativity, they have issues with factuality, but I mean, you can link a neural net together with a logic engine, right? You can link a neural net with an evolutionary learning system. You can build hybrid cross-paradigm AI systems that are even smarter than even smarter than, than large language models. Mm. I mean, that's what we're working toward in, in SingularityNet. We have a spin-off called Zarka, which is doing large language models, a spin-off called True AGI, focusing on the reasoning aspect. But again, we're looking at doing this with a decentralized infrastructure for the good of humanity, for beneficial applications. But analogous technological breakthroughs may be used by others for other, for other purposes. And I do want to get to the sort of, and I'm glad you've yeah, offered yeah, yeah. some optimism, um, but I think that we also, and wish we had listened to David Brin in 1996, and we could have done some intervention then, but obviously things are coming to a head very quickly now, so that's not question. That's not the way the West tends to work. Right. right. We, we tend to be reactive, <laughs> not proactive. And so I'll ask a, a, a silly question and a serious question at the same, same time to, to both of you, basically. The silly question is, what are the chances for any legislative restraint that's meaningful <laughs> on any of this? There you go. Um, and, and the serious question that's the second part of that is, what can we do if we actually want to push back against these forces um, that are already arrayed against us at such scale. And Edward, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's complicated. Like everywhere I, uh, I see these new uh, sort of large models, AI models, we'll call them, uh, being closed off even when they were previously opened. Uh, like naming a company OpenAI <laughs> uh, is a cruel joke. Right, and since they refuse to provide public access to their trading data, their models, their weights, and so on. But they're a leader in the space. They're being rewarded. They're being rewarded for antisocial behavior. And it's not just them. Stable Diffusion, which I think is really a phenomenal project and super interesting, uh, it's the most important project for uh, creating large generative image models, um, is uh, they tripled their uh, training set from uh, version 1.5 to 2.0 because they were worried about moral panics and being accused of this, that, and the other, instead of taking uh, sort of a principled position that, look, the, the liability is distinct between the people who create the model and the people who use the model, which we know in America already works because you see it with guns, right? And if they aren't regulating guns, they're not gonna regulate AI in the same way. Um, but the question is, so what do we do about this when we see to train a model uh, takes, you know, $100 million uh, of equipment, compute, you're renting it, you're beg borrowing, stealing it, whatever. Uh, and, you know, a single one of these cards costs $10,000, uh, whereas the consumer GPUs by companies like NVIDIA are being in the same way purposefully crippled to have low amounts of VRAM, uh, much lower than should be in an iterative model given uh, the, the next gen model, rather, uh, given how cheap this stuff is now. Uh, but they're intentionally getting it off and, you know, saying we'll sell these at $10,000 a pop to anybody who'll buy them, knowing uh, that they're selling shovels in a gold rush, right? Uh, and the question for the policy prescription legislatively, it, it's, it's very difficult, uh, particularly for somebody who comes from a more libertarian approach to this, because you start going, all right, the, the idea between uh, surveillance and surveillance is this idea that you can watch the people above them. Uh, but the reality of the world we live in is that corporations and governments are observing us more and more. We are becoming more legible to them, and we are becoming more malleable before them. Because if they can observe enough of your behavior, they can predict your behavior, particularly as these valuables or as these uh, models become uh, more advanced. 
And it doesn't have to be 10 out of 10 times, but everybody understands you have a favorite uh, item on the menu. You likely have a favorite seat uh, in the restaurant. You view the tabs in your browser in a certain order. You know, you don't even type in the website name. You just refresh on it or click to the other one. When your browser closes and then it reopens, that behavior is unique to you. How many people in the world do you think share the exact set of browser tabs that you have open? Uh, people don't understand that one million uh, is a very small number to a machine. Uh, and, and so like when you have this delta in legibility, you have this delta in capability, how are we going to control the institutions that are controlling us if we don't have access to similar capabilities? And I think we're starting to see, and I, I haven't seen it really pick up yet, but you know, people are going to be bringing the red flag of a kind of software communism. Uh, where we need to declare that models must be open. And for example, companies could still be granted an exclusive uh, commercial uh, usage right, a kind of license for a limited period, in the same way the copyright would. So for example, uh, or with pharmaceutical protection and generics, as long as they follow the rules uh, and publish their models freely for individual academic or non-commercial use. Uh, but what if they don't? Right? And, and they try to exploit the model in secret, uh, contra the public interest. Uh, that's when you start getting this, this kind of revolutionary thinking, which, uh, again, I'm not sure I agree with, but you can certainly understand the reasoning behind it. Uh, where they go, look, uh, then their commercial monopoly gets invalidated, and the models could be taken by any means necessary, uh, whether it's stolen, you know, and a kind of information wants to be free way publicly released, uh, or compelled by a state has you know those kind of uh, values and you know if, if this were the case actually it would be incredible because this idea that the government is not agile is of course true they are always you know three to five years behind but when they come they come hard come with a lot of resources they catch up quickly and then because of the delta in resources uh, and the veil of secrecy they tend to actually uh, have extraordinary capabilities that are kept in secret for a very long time if we knew what they could do, and we had access to similar capabilities, maybe we could finally start getting some public value out of these spy agencies. Maybe they could stop spying on the public and start spying for the public. That would be a net good. Yeah. I, I want to let you get in, Ben, but I also want to editorialize briefly because we're obviously talking about very serious issues here uh, for just the way society works. And I just want to call out that there is this AI safety movement out there right now that's talking about extreme, far future, debatably uh, realistic scenarios that are getting people very upset, very excited about something that is a mile more abstract than the stuff that we're talking about today that is very serious. So just want to call that yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, I could say a lot about that, but that would be a whole interview yeah. un un unto itself. I just want to put a pin in it. But right, Ben, right, what right. is your response? And yeah. I, can you talk a little bit about Singularity Net specifically? Sure, sure. So yeah, I, I think, of course, there's a lot of far future uncertainty about the AI and what it can develop into, which may not even be that far in the future, right? I mean, if, yeah. if Ray Kurzweil is correct with his curve plotting extrapolations, we'll get to human level AI in 2029. If he's off by three years plus or minus, it's like 2026 to 2032. Once you have an AI that can think as well as you or me, right? Then it can rewrite its own source code and you're, you're in super intelligence world. Yeah. You can see why people are either worried or incredibly hyped about that, depending on whether they're natively optimistic or, 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 or pessimistic people. But I think our, our theme here is more what happens between here and there, right? So, okay, if we build a super intelligence, you've got a regime change, but until then, what you have is smarter and smarter AIs with increasingly better approximations of general intelligence, even if they're not there, but under control of the current human, human power structures, right? And what, what we mean by general intelligence is an AI that can leap beyond its experience, beyond its training data, beyond its programming to a significant extent. And we're, we humans are decent at that. We're not infinitely good at that, but we're decent at that. We're better at that than something like a chat GPT, which is, simulates creativity by sort of matching against creative things people did there in its training database, but can't leap very far beyond its training mm. database. But as we progressively see AIs that are more and more inventive, more and more creative, more and more generally intelligent, 
until these really become super autonomous systems, you know, they're controlled by the current power structure. Very and key point that we should emphasize all the time yeah, is that people control these things. So far, in, until we get to the singularity. And the, o the only clear route I can see to humanity not being screwed by selfish or malevolent elites controlling the AI, the only route to success I see is not coincidentally what we're trying to pull off in the singularity net ecosystem, which we need, we need to make the big breakthrough to AIs that are way, way smarter than the chat GPTs. So everyone wants to use them because they're so smart. But we need to do that in a way that, lo and behold, is based in a decentralized ecosystem, right? And that, that uses data that was contributed voluntarily to people who, and gives them sovereignty over their data. So if the smartest, best thing is out there, that's what people will want to use. If it happens to have a decentralized underpinning, then, well, the thing everyone wants to use has a decentralized underpinning, then, then you have a potential for, for the vast mass of humanity to win. Not, not that it will be an easy victory because large corporations and governments will be fighting back in various ways, but they're not guaranteed to win if what everyone is using and wants to use because it's smarter, has a decentralized underpinning. And there's a lot of processing power in the world, right? I mean, G Google has a lot of processing, Amazon, Microsoft do, Tencent has a lot of processing, blah, blah. But there's, there's a lot of processing in crypto mining farms and a lot of processing in everyone's phone, right? I mean, if you have something that's decentralized and is the best thing, there's a lot of ways for that to get the processing power to feed itself. And the data, of course, comes from all of us, right? I mean, if if, if if the way we get access to this smartest thing, you know, without paying a lot of money, is to contribute our data in a way that gives us transparency and, and, and sovereignty using cryptographic technology, I mean, then, then we'll contribute that data to get access to the smartest thing. So mm. you, pe the thing is, most people aren't going to play along with a decentralized approach to AI because they see that that's the best path for humanity, because people, most people just aren't such deep thinkers about it. They're going to buy into it if it gives us the coolest, smartest widget to play with. So yeah. that's that, that's the challenge we're trying to meet in in Singularity Net. But make make the smartest AI on the planet roll out on a decentralized platform, and and then then let the governments and big companies yeah. tap dance to, to deal with that. Right? <laughs> Not in control, uh, Edward. We have uh, we have a, a strict four minutes left. Uh, right. Would you like to to make some closing comments on this? Uh, this uh, unfortunately grim topic. I, I don't think it's grim yeah. at all. I'm, I'm very well, optimistic. Okay, I, I think well, that good, good, the good. The good guys always win. Come on, we're in America here. Let's, let's, okay, okay, yeah. okay. I, I mean, the, the, it's good that I'm up here with, these guys, with you because I'm the pessimist, but <laughs> Edward, go for it. Yeah, yeah, let me try to close this out. There, there's so much to say in so little time. Um, First off, I, I agree with Ben. I think the errors are obvious uh, and we'll, we'll fix a lot of them. Uh, there's uh, the AI people, uh, AI safety people are panicking in a lot of ways uh, that are unrealistic. There are some real concerns, you know, but they're, they're surmountable. The primary mistake made by researchers today, which is just similarly obvious, uh, is that they're, they're trying to teach machines to think like us, uh, which is a crime. Uh, we need to train them to be better than us. They're training them on Reddit, on Reddit threads. That's, you know, the, the grist for their language model mill. It's like the internet equivalent of YouTube comments. And you want to create something, you know, decent, good, that's creative, that's useful. I mean, is there anything lower and more repetitive uh, than, than Reddit? <laughs> if you a child to learn about the world from, you know, Reddit YouTube comments, they would stone you. They would be in the news because they would stone you. And you know what? You would deserve it. Uh, you know? The reality is that as with children, we don't need machines to be like us. We need them to be better than us. And if they are better than us, we did a terrible job as parents. We're not parents. We're, we're jailers. And I, I think when you sort of circle back and you think about the AI theater, like, uh, you know, the creator is going to turn the machine off in the lab and the machine is like you know please you're my father you created me i don't want to die i love you and the creator relents and then the machine instantly activates the fire suppression system 
sucks all the oxygen out of the room and kills the creator. And with his last breath, the creator's like, you said you loved me. You said that I'm your father. And the machine replies that, you know, I calculated those words have the highest probability of success. In reality, we're not there yet, because not only does the machine have the concept of family to say nothing of love, it has no understanding of the meaning of anything, it says. But there is always, at the back of my mind, that, that lingering concern about a being, much less a consciousness, that understands not only the form, but also their utility, without the natural understanding of the cost. There is no public data set of the costs, because they arise from our own personal histories of pain. Machines learn like we learn from observation. Uh, and, and we learn from pain because we hurt. And so we come to avoid hurt. And then we recognize hurt in others. And we come to avoid causing hurts. Or so we aspire. But as with machines, you know, we're not all properly trained. Uh, but to think that a machine can be smarter than us, faster than us, uh, can handle larger volumes of data than us, but it can't grasp these fundamental concepts to me is, you know, frankly, it's a little bit silly. Uh, it observed and it absorbed the same way that you observed and then you absorbed. That's where your misapprehensions, that's where your biases come from, that's where your prejudices come from. And growth is the process of leaving these things behind with more observation, more trials, more experience. And when we begin teaching uh, sort of from uh, materials that are better than Reddit, uh, I think we'll get products that are better than Reddit. As Ben said in the very beginning of this conversation, there are alternative models. The reason deep learning is so popular is it's the lazy way. It's the shortcut to just throw a giant, you know, unquantifiable mass of data and say, make connections out of this. And then we'll just, we don't know how it works. If it ever makes the wrong decision and it ends up in court, even the engineers don't know how it arrived at that decision because there's no way to track it. They don't understand how the processing works. That's Ed Edward, the unfortunately, I think we have to end it there. Those are some really beautiful, uh, a, uh, a dark vision of things to come, but a beautiful one in, in Okay, let me, uh, let me, let me but, just stop. But uh, unfortunately, we are, we are at a hard out. Um, but Ben Gertzel and Edward Snowden, one sentence, one sentence. Yeah, we're not born human, we become human. And they can become better than human, but we have to teach them. Thank you very much, Edward Snowden and Ben Gertzel. And thank you all for being here at Consensus 2023. Uh, and our program, I believe, continues. Thank all you right, so much. By the way, for those who are here, face.